transparent and open space. And um, we're talking about it all. <laughs> okay. So we're live now we're live on Facebook. We are. And I just want to thank everybody for taking their time out on this Sunday evening to come and spend some time with us to talk about things that really matter, such as trauma. I'm pretty sure everyone, almost everyone is going home for the holidays. And when we, um, when we say home for the holidays, we mean home as in the people. Um, our, our family are, are, is our home, you know. Um, home doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be a place, um, but for the most part, our home is the people who raised us, no matter if they're blood related or they're not. Um, and <laughs> thank you for <laughs> joining us. So now that we're live on Facebook, you can go ahead and share with your peers. Um, we're going to get the conversation started. And um, just to see, just to, while we're starting, we're gonna start utilizing the chat and I'm just gonna ask um, how many people are going home for the holidays and um, you know, visiting family or like close friends or anything for the holidays. And this, I mean, I am, I plan on going to Jersey <laughs> this weekend, that's where I'm from. So um, yeah. We have more people joining. So as you are joining, um, please make sure that your mics are on mute. Um, we will give audience feedback. We also have Amira um, monitoring the chat, the live feed on, um, on Facebook. We are streaming live currently on Facebook. So if you got a chance, go ahead and share. Tell everyone to join and get involved with the conversation. So when we're talking about going home for the holidays, one of the main things that happens that some people don't realize that um, going home and seeing certain people, um, it brings up triggers. And most people don't know what triggers are. Um, most people don't know what their triggers are. And some of those people that we call home you know, people we're going back to, um, those people can be our triggers. So we have, as you saw on the flyers, on social media, we have the beautiful Joella Smith, who is a licensed social worker. We also have Asia from Survivor by Chance um, as one of our panelists. Also, Joella is one of It's My Movement's therapists. So if you have while we're having this conversation, if you have any questions in regards to triggers, the, the topics of discussions, feel free to throw it in the chat. Amira will shout it out there. We will talk about it. We will address it. The whole point of having this event is so we can start having a conversation and addressing a lot of things and um, start learning how to deal with those things as we enter a new year. You know, um, and we also have the beautiful Tierra Parker of um, Global Activist Awards. I don't know why my brain just went right there. Of Global Activist Awards, who's very busy, I'm sure. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all ladies for joining us. Thank you to participants that's on right now, that's joining us. Anybody that's streaming, that's streaming with us live right now on Facebook. Um, Thank you for joining us and anybody just go ahead. I can't see the chat personally, so I won't be like, hey, anybody shout outs, anything. I don't see anything of that sort. So we just wanna have the conversation. And um, so since we're now starting off with triggers, Joella, um, you wanna, um, you know, what are triggers? Yeah, so hey, welcome everybody. Welcome beautiful queens. So hey. triggers are responses we have to trauma, mental illness, or any other struggles that we're dealing with. So like you said, I mean, around the holidays, we're exposed to a lot of triggers, whether that means returning home, 
being around the people that may have done something wrong to us, whether that's even hearing a song or smelling a smell could be a trigger. And again, this relates to people who have lost this year, who have experienced loss and trauma. You know, this year was hard on all of us. And it might be the first year that we're either really dealing with our trauma or setting boundaries or the first year we're dealing with loss. So a lot of things this holiday season can be a trigger. And usually I like to keep it basic as triggers can be people, places, and things, okay? So that could be our grandmother's house where something may have happened. It could be our uncle. It could be a friend that maybe we just seen in the mall somewhere while we're holiday shopping. Or it could be actual things like smells, songs, pictures, you know, all of these different environmental factors we respond to. And usually if it's, it's, it hits really deep, we respond with trauma responses. You know, so some triggers you may see is, hey, if we're exposed to these people, places, and things, we may find that it may be harder to sleep at night, you know, as we approach Christmas or whatever holiday it is. We may find our heart racing before these events. We may find ourselves being hyper vigilant, you know, especially as these holidays come and we kind of may waver on what we may want to do. And again, triggers could be people. And I think, especially as we move on with this conversation and how we have gone through the holidays, I think that will be the main trigger that we discuss. You know, because again, people can cause trauma. We could lose people. So that is, that's a huge trigger. So again, triggers can also cause, you know, trauma responses. So such as isolation, increased irritability, increased worry. You know, if I lost someone and I smell their favorite perfume or I hear their favorite song, I'm immediately going into that anxiety cycle where now I'm worried, I'm, I'm hypervigilant. I may be having flashbacks. And next thing I know, I'm in a very negative headspace. So I kind of want to open the floor to you guys and, and explore and ask you guys, what do you do in case you are triggered this holiday season? And what have your experiences been? We all don't have to go at the same time, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, uh, when I was triggered, I would go back into a meditative state or I breathe. I breathe in, breathe out, and allow myself to know that I'm safe. Allow myself to know this is an experience and that this is not something that happened to me in the past. This is just a reminder, it's a trigger. Allow yourself to know that this is not the same event that happened prior and that you are in a safe space. Just keep reminding yourself, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe. And the more you do that, the more you go with your breaths and the more you bring yourself back and you ground yourself, that will bring you back to the space you need to be in. I like that. Um, me, for me, when I'm triggered, um, I too, um, Asia, I also, um, I breathe for a second. I mentally, um, I have to mentally gain myself first before I, um, you know, probably not even respond because sometimes it's best not to respond. Um, sometimes it's best to just do what is best for yourself and remove yourself from that situation. You always have to make sure that um, your mental health um, is first because when you go into a spiral of being hypervigilant, you start having um, anxiety or a panic attack or something like that, you know, it becomes worse off uh, because depending on who you are around when you are triggered, sometimes th that can be a person that's a trigger. And um, in a sense, it's kind of like giving that person power and whatever. So like, it's really important for you to understand what and who and 
what like anything that is your trigger and like what to do what is what to do is but what what is best for you in the case that you are triggered because not the same thing works for everybody for me I can just listen to oldies like I can listen to old school music and I can get myself in a groove and I can like you know sometimes I can go for a walk or something or I can just like lay on my bed and do nothing uh, you know, it just watch Netflix or something. Just choose not to give someone my energy. Um, the block button is very valid, you know? So, you know, um, yeah. What about you, Tiara, in a place that you're triggered? Yo, I was having some technical difficulties over here. It would not unmute when y'all asked the question. <laughs> okay. So for me, I think I, I have to take it back because for me, it was the people it was multiple people that were triggers for me and when you have to be in that space for them I remember the amount of see I asked when I get real mad I sweat so like the amount of sweating that I would do and how I would handle it like I would be so mad that I would forget myself at some point and then as time went on I had to teach myself that at the end of the day you got to take care of you and what I did for those moments, I, I had to learn how to do some meditation and breathing exercises. And they actually played a huge part in that, like over, like, um, overnight, like at night or before I'm getting ready for the event. Or sometimes if I got to step completely out of that place, then that's what you got to do to get yourself together. Like you said, taking that walk or whatever the case may be to come back to it. And for me, it was always, I need to get away from you for a second. Like, I just can't even be in the same room. I got to reevaluate who I am that first at first because I'm, I'm giving you way too much power and you could care less about what's happening with me right now because you're not losing no sleep I am I'm losing myself trying to fall I'm because I'm seeing you and I'm focusing on whatever you have done to me and it's just all coming back at one shot like y'all know how the movies go when they had those flashes of like your entire life that's what's happening with me whenever I see people that I can't stand or whatever the case may be now I, ain't, I don't even give you the energy sometimes I, I have to I, I have to learn I had to learn how to play as you never existed so I don't even know you when I do see you and and but that came from taking that time out for myself knowing what I can and cannot tolerate what I will not tolerate anymore and giving myself that distance to say I gotta care for my heart at the end of the day because when I leave here you're not going to leave your, your toxicity on top of me. I'm going to leave it here with you once I walk out this door because that's the end of it. And that's it. I don't even have to see you often. It's not like I got to deal with you every day. So my best bet is them breathing exercises and that meditation or like Camilla said, that they're taking that walk, Lord, that, that's the best way to go. That's the only thing I can say for a lot of people. Walk, walk, take a walk. Listen to you. take your walk, I, save and, lives. I tell okay, you, and do yeah, it. Say, listen lives. to your music, like us. <laughs> like, because you know, sometimes with people, I feel like when they know, when it comes, let's just say people, because we have people in our family who know that you are a trigger, that they are a trigger to you, is what I mean. They know that. So for some people, they get a thrill out of it and they will nitpick at you and they will, they will antagonize you for as long as they can, for as long as you allow. And, and, and as long as you have control over yourself and you know who you are and because you family and whoever you used to, whoever the person that, let me just use myself, who I used to be, you know, it has nothing to do with who I am now. And sometimes people in your family, they will only see you for who you used to be. And that's okay. You know, you can't force everybody to see who you've grown to be, who you changed. Like, it, you, you, can't ex you can't expect for people to congratulate you when you've succeeded on certain goals and you've making a way for yourself and you're no longer the, like you're no longer who you used to be, you know. Sometimes taking a walk saves lives. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, um... <laughs> uh, um, Amira, anybody in a chat or anything or like we want to open it up to the floor about triggers like any questions that you have about triggers um, what any do any feedback on what do you do in a case that you are triggered uh, what do you do and someone says yes this is true they're agreeing with you Camilla and 
purposely bring things up to get to you. Yes, I agree. A lot of people will intentionally trigger you because they want to see you get irritated. They want to see you get riled up. They want to be able to say, she hasn't changed. She hasn't grown. She oh, hasn't look done you. anything. Oh. The way that she said she was going to do, she's still the same person. Don't allow people to put you in that space. Do not allow people to put you in a space where you feel that you haven't grown because you have, you have mm -hmm. evolved, you have grown, you have moved to where you're destined to go, but people will want, they want to see that. So don't give them that satisfaction. That's the word right there. <laughs> yes, that's I, right i agree i mean we have to we got to be aware of what they're doing because like you said i mean some people are aware that they are our triggers you know we walk into a room with maybe our mom or somebody they know exactly the right buttons to push that gets us to that point but the reason this conversation is so important is because we have to be aware we have to identify what our triggers are before we go zero to 100 because that's usually what happens when we don't sit back and reflect. You know, any people, places, or things that cause overwhelming stress can be a trigger. And sometimes if it's a loved one or it's anybody else, we, can, we might choose to look past that and then just allow them to get us to that point without kind of reflecting to say, hey, this person's triggering me. What should I do now? You know? If you don't mind, if I can interject on that about the loved one. That 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 right there, <laughs> because I, I think a lot of people, you know, I always tell people sometimes there are folks that make the cutoff list that you never expected to make the cutoff list. So sometimes that may be your mama, your auntie, your grandmama, your cousin, your niece, nephew, brother, sister, aunt, whatever. You know, those people sometimes they make the cutoff list. So I there is, a, you know, for me, I know there's are people that will look past it, like you know, because that's that is my folks. You know, we are a family. That's that's something that we are no because if they have to go they got to go too because they toxic they got some stuff they got to work on for themselves they could come back they got the see that's the, the benefit of them being family because when they decide that they want to get themselves together then at that point you could come back when you get yourself healed and then we can have a real conversation and let's tackle that head on because i think a lot of people forget like just because we family does not mean that you can continue to do the things that you do and because they families they know the buttons they know the triggers they know how to get to you and they want to see it happen because they just want to make a fool out of you it ain't even about just getting a laugh off of them they want to make a fool out of you for everybody else because they don't probably told a story to somebody else about you and you don't know about it They're, that term didn't name is being mentioned in rooms that you ain't even being walked in walked in yet that goes both ways whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and some people can do it in a negative light and not only that most people who know that you have like you've actually changed you're doing good things for yourself and let's just call them for who they are they're your haters right because obviously it's obvious i'm succeeding it's obvious i'm not who i'm used to be it's obvious i'm better at communicating it's I, all those things are obvious but this type of person that we what we are talking about that could be a trigger for someone in their family this type of person only want to shine light on the negative things that you used to do they only want to hold on to that person that you used to be and they only acknowledge and some people will only see you as that person who you used to be. And like I said before, that's okay. It's okay. You don't have no control over it. The only person you have control over is yourself, how you react, how you respond, how you choose not to respond. It is re completely up to you. And, you know, sometimes the, the problem with not knowing when, when someone in your family is a trigger is that you get more power I tell you, if anybody who's going home for the holidays this week and you got that cousin or you got that somebody who you know like to nitpick at you at the fam at the at the table or whatever, don't give them none of your energy. Don't get don't acknowledge it. Don't acknowledge their uh, antagonistic um, approaches. Don't acknowledge none of it. And there's so much power in not giving anyone your power and your energy to to change your mood or anything like it's really up to you 
Like no one has control over how you react or how you respond, but you. And the only way to take control of that is to know. You know, cousin Pete is going to keep talking about my forehead. I know. But that's why I wore a ponytail today because I'm okay with my five head. You know what I'm saying? That type of that type of thing. Sometimes you gotta switch it up on people. They don't know what to do. Okay. So um An another yeah. thing is um sometimes people will ask you questions intentionally to trigger you. So mm -hmm. you may be in front of your whole family and as you're just chit chat and everybody's laughing they may say well have you spoken to such and such knowing that you may not have spoken to that person that's the moment when they're intentionally trying to trigger you you don't have to answer any questions you're not obligated to give people answers to satisfy them you can just say i don't want to talk about that i don't need to talk about that and you can change the subject and be okay with it. They may still keep going and to edge on at you. That's the time you walk away. And we're going to hashtag that walking away saves lives. We're going to hashtag that <laughs> somewhere because it's, it's, a, it's a true fact um, because it goes, I feel like it goes back to energy and like when people say energy, energy really does transfer. And for some people, you have to be that positive bubble that nobody can just come and just think. And then now you in a bad mood. Now you cussing out everybody else. Now the, the, the sweet potato is on the floor. We can't have no turkey. Now you done took the stuff and out. Like uh, things done just went haywire because you know, you don't understand that as we have been to grandma's house for these past couple of holidays, this is always the main thing. You know, sometimes you got to like change the way that you even going to go into the situation. Sometimes it's just only certain people that you want to go see. And it's okay to just go and see those people and go on about your night. You don't even have to stay there. Most people on Thanksgiving, most people go to about five houses. At least I know. I know most people go to about five houses in one night. Okay. So yeah, before we so before we move on, um on to the triggers, like anybody, um, any participants that's on right now have any feedback on triggers? Do you have any questions about triggers? Um, do you want to share your experience when you were triggered and how you've handled that situation? Um, anything about triggers? Because it's a real thing, you know, and we got to have these type of conversations because it's a lot of one of the other reasons why I come to the holidays, you know, a couple of families are on the news because conversations went wrong at the dinner table, you know, so um, Amira, anybody in the chat? Um, uh, yeah, we have about three two comments and a question. The first person says they may look to create issues if there are none, she's experienced it. And secondly, to don't give them any power. Uh, the next comment says, yes, some people love to live in chaos and that is toxic for them and for you. And if you choose to stay in that, protect yourself and leave because your good energy matters. Good karma is a real thing. They're not worth any negative vibes and the question was has anyone experienced family dismissing their triggers if they are brought up or discussed i want to add something um, based on my own experiences um, for me the way i was able to deal with family and any outside people was through empathy and boundaries so me i like you know, you know this Camilla about me. I love reading like biographies and everybody. I like to get people's, to know people's past and see why they are the way they are. Because um, a lot of people are who they are because of the experiences that they've had in life. And when I learn more about them and why they are the way they are, I get to understand that um, even though their negativity is directed towards me, it's not about me. 
It's something that they are experiencing themselves and they're trying to put me in the limelight to get the attention of whatever they're going through off of themselves. And sometimes, you know, instead of engaging in someone who's trying to put me in the limelight, I can simply say, you know, why are you directing your negativity towards me? What's going on with you that you need to focus some negative attention towards me? And a lot of times that will, you know, make a person step back and be like, oh, well, uh, you, you know, they get caught up because you no know, one's expecting you to say something like that to them. They're expecting you to react and give them the negativity that they're trying to put onto you. So I can look at someone and say, basically feel sorry for them so that I'm not angry at this person. You get what I'm saying? Like that doesn't work for everyone. This is just how I am able to cope with, you know, negative people in my life. And boundaries is when, all right, I understand why you are the way you are. I empathize with you. I get why you're so negative. I get you went through a lot of stuff and now you're taking your anger out on me. I understand that. But at the same time, we can't be in close proximity. If this person's coming towards me to have a conversation and I know, I, I even though I'm not going to respond negatively, I don't want to deal with this. I can just scooch over to someone else and start talking to them, you know, just avoidance. <laughs> Maybe it's not healthy to some people, but for me it is. And I can still be cordial. Like, hello, how you doing? Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, you're so pretty. Throw in a compliment here and there, you know, and then just going about my business. I think I think it's also very good to put people in their place. Okay. Do not feel guilty for telling someone you're stepping over the line. You know exactly what you're doing and we're not going to have this conversation don't feel guilty if people invite you to certain places and you don't want to go you're not obligated to go either so I liked how, how you, oh. okay. <laughs> no, no no i was just gonna say how i liked how you said don't feel guilty because yeah. sometimes that's part of managing our triggers is work and pass any shame or guilt that may happen and learning how to set those personal boundaries to say, Hey, I'm going to protect my mental health and choose positivity compared to going through that and being triggered. Yeah. So I kind of wanted to like go back around to the question on, um, what do we like, how do we deal with, or our experience? That's what, that was a question to mirror our experience on, um, dealing with family who dismiss that and knowing that they're a trigger and dismiss. Um, I can just say real quick, um, anybody who know me, it's not a secret that my sister and I do not get along. Me and my full blood, same mom, same dad, we do not get along. For whatever reason, she always hated me since I was a kid. Maybe she was upset that she wasn't the only child anymore and just like held on to it for the rest of her life. I don't know. So for me, with going home for the holidays, I know that there's, well, for one, my sister isn't involved in anything that's involved in the family. She has her own situations and it goes back to, um, I don't forget who said that, like sometimes it's not, it's not you, it's the person really. And um, I've come to learn that over the years and um, over the, I have family members who will be like, um, did you and your sister, um, when the last time I spoke to your sister? And honest to God, I have not seen my, I have not spoken to see my sister well, I've seen her, but I haven't spoken to my sister or like had a type of relationship with her or my nephews in about seven years now. I don't say about like six, seven years, whatever her issue is, I really don't know. But like whenever she used to be, a, I said that to say my sister used to be a big trigger for me, where if whatever she had to say, or if anybody asked me a question, I was just blowing up like, you know, because my sister, like my sister is just so, she's so nasty towards me and I can't understand like why, like, and, and I've, I've tried to like, you know, talk it over with her and stuff, things like that. But like, it always go downhill or something like that. But I always have family who would be like, oh, well, it's both of y'all. Oh, well, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? And I'm like, I've personally, I, I won't say that I've reached out, but like, you know, I've done little things here and there like when the pandemic first happened and I was 
taking water up to New York. I make sure my, cause my mom stayed with my sister. So make sure they having what they need. My sister don't want nothing from me. She angry. So now, so now, you know, um, I just, I know that when I know that we're going to be in the same area or whatever, to me, whatever, for me personally, when I come near her, her whole mood and attitude changes. Like she, like she can be laughing, kicking with somebody. As soon as I come around, she can <laughs> real quick. And for some, whatever reason is really, it's really exciting to me because it's like, it's been mad years and you don't know why you're mad. We don't know why we're mad. And well, you don't know. I'm not upset or anything. I can see her and I'd be like, hey girl, hey, how you doing? And she, hey. Some people you just can't allow to like, you know, just like bring that, that negative energy into you. And like, when it comes to my family being like, oh, it's both you guys, or you have to be, um, you, one of you have to be the bigger person and blah, blah, blah. I feel like at this point in my life, I've done enough work on myself to know that if my sister was to come to me today or tomorrow to have a conversation with me and really get down to the middle of why she have an issue with me, I would be open to that because I've grown in over this seven year period that I haven't spoken to her. I'm a whole grown woman. I can communicate and articulate how I feel. If, there, if I was hurt in any type of aspect, I can say that to her or whatever, and it can be whatever. But like, you know, for some people, it just really goes back to they have their own some people have their own issues and it has nothing to do with you me I forgive I forgive him myself or whatever it was about her that triggered me personally that will just get me from I'll be sitting here yeah then I, ah, now I'm snapping or whatever whatever made me do that I've I've dealt with that so I can go in a room with, you have to, when it comes to family who trigger you and if other family members who's making it out to be like, oh, maybe it's you and maybe it's whatever. As long as you know that you've done the work on yourself and you know that you've taken that power when you're able to be in the same room at the dinner table with that person and do not be bothered mentally, no nothing. You can sit there and have key, key, key with your cousin or whatever, talk about the time when y'all both got beatings or whatever and whatever the situation and keep the environment positive because it's family and we're talking about going home for the holidays and it's, you know, you, you always, that's supposed to be, Home is where the heart is, you know, and that's where everyone get their first experience that love, no matter if it's good or bad. And that's really how you go out into the world. And at some point we become adults and deal with how or whomever had triggered how we could we, you get you have the choice to deal with that on your own. You don't need the other person. You don't need their forgiveness. You can forgive yourself and move forward with it. Sometimes it's not best to have the conversation right then and there. Sometimes it's best to just, you know, go. So I'm going to stop rambling. And I want to ask the other ladies, um, back to the question that was in the chat, you know, what, like, what do you, how do you handle family members who dismiss that, you know, the fact that they know that you're, that they're a trigger for you and they just, just dismiss it completely. For dismissals, you just got to be okay with them dismissing it. Understand that they're dismissing it for a reason. They're not going to try to, uh, you know, engage or try to make you feel better or even try to address the situation. So if someone dismisses something that you're trying to address, be like, okay, no worries let it go and move forward. Because if you don't, you're going to keep trying to get them to address it. Now you're going to get angry. You're going to get overwhelmed. You're going to get real hyper and you're going to want to argue and maybe fight. Let it go. Walking away saves lives. Hashtag that for the rest of the night. <laughs> I yes. agree 100% with it. I agree. I, I think um, for me that that whole if since you want to dismiss it the topic is done we're done we can move on for, to something else the problem is is that what's done in the dark will always come to light and that you there will be a conclusion from that you will find they it will be addressed it may not be that moment but it will be addressed may not be the right timing but it will be addressed and 
another thing is that if they are dismissing it, be okay with walking out. Like you said, walking away saves lives. If that's the case, be okay with saying, you know what, I'm going to cut this visit short. I'm going back to my hotel, going back to wherever, I, my house, if, if, if that's the case, wherever I'm, I'm going, I'm out. I'll see y'all another time. Matter of fact, it's, I'm pretty sure you probably know like five other people have Thanksgiving dinner somewhere else. You can go somewhere else and that won't, and don't feel guilty about it. Don't make, don't let them, cause they're going to go like, see, she left. Cause I said something, this or he left or they left or whatever, because I, uh, X, Y, and Z. Nope. This is what you do. That's fine. You can tell them whatever you want. I already know why I left. If anybody was to ask me, I'll correct them. And that it comes with, back to that whole putting them in their place. Let me just check you real quick and let you know that the only reason why I left is because it's for me, not for you. I can care less about what you feel like. Boom. Yeah, and I, I think that's the most frustrating part, right? That we might have to sometimes accept that other people don't understand where we're coming from or understand our experiences. And for our own self-preservation, we got to accept that and learn to move on or walk away. And I think that's, that's hard to do sometimes, you know, because sometimes we try and push and push and in the end, they might not ever understand where we're coming from or what our experience has been. So, um, yeah, that was <laughs> all greatness. So before we go on to the next question and topic, which is, which is the most, I'm pretty sure everybody has heard this before, before I say it. So before we go there, on from triggers, right? Because we have to establish just about triggers before we go on to the next topic that we're talking about. Because this within itself, I can almost promise, is the trigger, okay? For some people, you know. Um, so uh, Amira, back to the chat. Let's um, anybody on Facebook that have any questions or have any more feedback on triggers, you know. Um, someone says guilt tripping is a big thing. Uh, someone else is saying, my dad has always told me everything isn't meant to be understood. What is done in the dark will always come to the light. You will always see the reason and conclusion can come from that and that point. Um, okay, uh, someone said, I would like to add that family members too have triggers and their own dysfunctional patterns of communication that they don't even realize that they're acting on. And the last one is don't let your triggers supersede your growth. When we choose to respond to triggers, we are also making the choice to regress to past behaviors or negativity or grief. That is all good stuff. So now that we have established that, are y'all ready for the number one trigger that we've talked about? <laughs> Woo! What happens in this house stays in this house. Okay, let's say this one more time. And I'm almost sure, I'm almost certain that anyone who's watching um, has someone in their family has expressed that what happens in this house stays in this house. So we would like to talk about that and touch on that and touch on how that really hurts a whole generation of people, that type of mentality. And we wanna talk about how we can break that cycle of what happens in this house. And um, if anybody wanted to give any type of um, examples where something had happened in that house um, and it did not help, you know, and how it unfolded and how you chose to, how you choose to deal with it and things like that. So we're going to open it back up to you ladies. Sure. Um, so for example, when I was a young child, my mother used to say what happens in his house stays in his house. Um, primarily one of the events that happened, um, someone called uh, child protective services on us uh, because my mom was missing. Uh, my mom would go missing for days, sometimes weeks. And because I was the oldest child, I was responsible to make sure that my siblings were taken care of. And so one time she went missing and I was not there. I was at a neighbor's house 
And I came home and I felt so bad. I felt guilty. I felt like it was my fault that if I was home, maybe no one would have, you know, called the child protective services. So what I, uh, uh, my grandmother said, what happens in this house stays in this house to me, meaning I should not go around telling anyone what happened. I should not go around telling anyone that Child Protective Services was there and that they were taking us away. I should not tell anyone that my mom was addicted to drugs because that that's what happened in our home and it was no one else's business. Well, we need to break that cycle. We need to stop telling young children these things because children absorb what you're saying. And when that happened from that moment, I no longer wanted to stay away from the home, um, no matter where we lived. Even if I lived with a relative, if I lived with a false peer, I did not like to stay away because I remember the words that were said to me when I was seven. What happens in our home stays in our home. You're not supposed to share with anyone. And I took on that responsibility. I took on not sharing my feelings, not sharing my emotions, not getting out the traumas and the experiences that I experienced because I was so traumatized by that statement. And because of it, I put up a guard and I no longer allow people into my, my heart space. And that's not good. It's not healthy. What about you, Joella? I feel the same. And I'm glad you opened up about that experience because I have a similar experience. I mean, and that phrase in itself kind of locks in the trauma and the pain and puts it in a box. And the box is your household. You know, and as we grow up through that trauma, we become adults who now have issues expressing ourselves, getting help, you know, expressing what we need from people. And again, as we get older, we realize that about ourselves. We now, again, have to be mindful of the, the perpetrator that caused that to us because we had to work on that and recover from that. So in effect, there is this victim and perpetrator type of dynamic where we have to work through. What about you, Tierra? I have to wholeheartedly agree. Um, definitely, was a, uh, that was a staple a staple at my household goes on this house stays in this house because and i get it like you know how black folks are people of any any generation of race you know nobody really wants nobody in a business but there is ways of doing that without telling somebody what goes on in this house stays in my house so you're telling me because i'm beefing with you right now mom i can't talk to you and but i have to be i have to keep it in here but see all they're going to do is is escalate more and more and more so until it gets worse and that has happened. That happened um, in a few instances where, um, <laughs> I'm opening up, <laughs> where like my mom was dating a guy at a time and he was horrible. And, you know, it was a lot going on, a whole lot. And what I mean by a lot going on, like there was a lot of arguing behind him because he was doing stuff. I told my mom he was doing some things. She didn't believe me when she found out. She never apologized. So I went and talked to other family members about it. And I guess they must have came back and told her and talked to her. Like, why, why are you doing this to her? And she's like, why are you telling everybody my business? Or why are you telling anything that goes on in this house? What goes on in this house? Stay in the house right there, that line. And it was just like, because I didn't think it was right and you weren't going to apologize for it and like I was always a very vocal child like if I was given that floor of being like listen I'm going to express how I feel don't ask me don't give me don't ask me what you think I think about this because I'm going to give you my honest opinion don't do that like I'm one I was one of those people that I was given that floor however it, it also came in some cases and backfired on me which wasn't fair because it was an open floor for me at one point now I'm telling you something and now you want to renege on it because there's something about you not want to accept that you're wrong and admitting you're wrong and then just saying that you're wrong and apologizing for it, it goes a long way because now I feel like I can it, it it damages not just the child and like how you express yourself to people but it also damages the trust part of that relationship so how can I and that, and that, that wasn't just my mom my dad did it to me too like I other family like it, it's a lot and how can I trust that I can come to you because without you coming at me a certain way and then they wonder why their children don't want to communicate with them at all because they can't really communicate them because you don't never know what you're going to get from them. And it, it goes longer than just, 
expressing yourself. It, it's also like dealing with your parents. So that, that can completely tear your whole relationship apart, especially when you get older. Because now you're in a mindset, oh my God, I, I was sick of this as a kid. I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of this. But you forget that you might want to try to repair the relationship with your mom and dad because I can't, I, I had to learn that I can't be mad for some, at someone for not having something in their life. But I learned something later in, in mind. And I have to kind of teach it. So I have to kind of step in that big girl role where I got to wear my big girl panties and kind of say, mom, like, this isn't a healthy way of doing this. Or dad, this ain't a healthy way of doing this. Or family, period. This ain't a healthy way of doing this. Let's try it this way. You kind of got to wear those big girl drawers for a second because you got to forgive them for they may not have known. And I, I had to learn that. It was rough, but I had to learn that. And it's it's still a thing, but it's, no, it's not nowhere near as what I experienced as a teenager growing up. Yeah, so, so when it comes to what, what happens in this house, stays in this house, I kind of want to touch on one of the main things that swept under the rug. And um, one of the reasons and how um, it's my movement came into existence because um, my rape and child molestation was um, swept under the rug by family members and everything. So, and it doesn't help. Um, and I'm glad, Tierra, that you uh, brought up to, like, you know, men relationships with your um, with your parents and everything. And I'm still working on it. Um, my father was my rapist. And I'm still working on, I would say working through, um, knowing what that forgiveness looks like. Um, because... I only I only want it to be how it should be. So to me, I personally, you know, I came back to a point where I, you know, I forgive myself. I forgive myself for the things I've gone through after I've experienced that. And I've forgiven myself for the situations I put myself in because of that. And um for see in my and in my household, it wasn't it wasn't exactly said what happens in this house stays in this house. It was just done. Okay. And um, when it came, I would, the first person I told was my grandmother. And then it went from my grandmother to my aunt. And then it was, it's a conversation and speculation around my family and everything like that. But it was just so confusing to me because my father isn't your family. So why are y'all like uh, still allowing him to like, you know, he's still coming home for dinner, you know? He's the, and, and they know this about, they know this about him. They still allowing him to come around my other little cousins. Like they still allowing him to come and eat at the table. And I'm not going to say that you should isolate a child predator, but you should acknowledge when someone is of sort, especially when it's someone that's in your family. And let me just say that my family, I, I don't know my father, my father was adopted. So I don't know my father's side of the family. So for my father, um, my mom's family was, was majority like his family. So, and, and as an adult, this is me as an adult internalizing it. Like, <laughs> asked me this probably like five or 10 years ago. I don't know if this has been the same response. But my father, um, my father was basically family to my mom's family. And um, they knew these things about my father and the crazy. And one thing about a child predator, rather if they are in the family or they're a family friend, first things first, that a predator is always someone who's close to home. Always someone who's close to home. And where there is one victim, there are multiple. Let's just say that. And I'm going to say that one more time for the people in the back and the other people on Facebook, anybody else out there that missed that. When a, someone is a child predator and they are in your family, for one, that has to be addressed. Rather, if it's he need therapy, rather, if he need a psychiatrist, rather, if he need to go to jail. Some people need just some people need to go to jail. And when it comes to certain family members, and I guess it depends on the person, some people feel like an apology is enough, you know, and for me, I won't say that I actually had that I don't. Okay, so let me just say in full transparency, right? Let's go back to 
to the disclosure on transparency. So when I went into foster care at 15, um, and the detectives asked me if I was being raped or molested by my father, I told them no. And the problem with the disconnect with that is the fact that for one, I'm a kid and to me, that was still my father. So I guess the little girl in me still wanted to protect my father and whatever. He still ended up going to jail for both of us, for me and my sister. He still ended up going to jail, didn't see him none. So he's, and he's been a registered sex offender. So I say that to say when there's one, there's multiple, you know what I'm saying? And it doesn't help when you have a, a, a sexual predator or a rapist or someone like that in your family, however you choose to deal with it, regardless, it needs to be dealt with because not only are you messing up one generation, you're messing up multiple generations. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you're messing up a lot of generations and this is how people grow up promiscuous. They grow up, um, you know, into spiraling out of control. I can just go on, a, I don't want to go on tangents. Just, I don't just want to use myself as an, as an example, but it's a fact that like with most people who have a child predator in their family, most people don't check it. So in light of me not going on a tangent, right? Oh, Asia, I see uh, uh, your mic open. So I'm going, I'm going to breathe a bit. I'm going to walk. <laughs> yeah, so um, first off, Camilla, I'm so sorry that happened to you and to any person that's in this space that have experienced experience any type of abuse, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's financial abuse, whether it's physical, emotional abuse, it is not your fault. It is not something that you did. You have no control over what happened to you, but you do have control over how you respond and how you heal. We are all responsible for our own healing. We are all responsible for how we're going to move forward. And so I want to send love and light and peace and blessings to each and every one of you, because even being on this call right now, you're doing work. Just listening to this is triggering. Just listening to the conversation and how you can heal can trigger you. And so just be kind and gentle to yourself in these moments. And always remember, most people never believe the, the survivor. I personally call people who, some people call them victims. I call us survivors because we survived through the situations, the experiences, and survivors need support. And so that's why we're here. We are supporting each and every one of you and know that no matter what happened to you, you can get through it. You know, if I don't, if you don't mind, first of all, of course, you know, girl, I love you. So, like, so thank you so much for sharing that for everybody. I'm, I may not have that same experience, but I know there's somebody out here who needed to really hear that. So nothing but praises and nothing but honor to you for standing into that and standing in your shit. That's, and that's it. And saying, listen, I'm going to own it. And that's just what it is. Um, I think for your family, the reason why they did that, it was denial and guilt. Because remember, before that happened to you, he was around before that. So God knows what happened prior to you getting there. And the sad thing is the families, are Black families specifically, are not equipped with the tools and stuff that they need to be able to fight through that and do what they need to do to stand up and say, oh, hell no, you will not get this opportunity again. Because God knows what happened could have happened to your mother, what could have happened to your, some of your cousins that were before you, that were when he was around, like God knows what. So it's, it's the denial and it's the guilt and then feeling like, oh my God, if I do say something, I'm gonna be the person who messes up this person's life forever. Or the denial, like, I don't think that really happened. Kids can have wild imaginations because you know they're quick to say that. So it's like, you know, and that's not always the case. When a, a child come and say something, they don't always make that. That doesn't, isn't always made up. You know, a cohort statement and then you know a statement that is coming from straight from the from the gut. Like this is something that actually happened. And it's sad because we are, some of our black families and I'm gonna speak for mine as well, are always equipped with the right communication skills or the right type of fight 
to get through that process because it's rough and they and some people will just and i hate to say it and some families are just straight up lazy they're like ah, i hear my i understand so this is what we're gonna do they're gonna make little mini modifications but they're not gonna make no real changes so he may have been able to still go out for dinner but they're gonna make sure they you know people got keeping eyes out but that may not have always been that may not always be the case sometimes they might turn the neck it out because they, he might have had something on them and that might have been part of it too. So I'm not saying they are 100% right for how they handled it because they if it was me, his ass would have been out the door. That, that ain't got nothing to do with it. But what I'm saying is, is that they aren't equipped so they don't know which direction to go. And I'm not defending it, but that is also an option and that's something that needs to be talked about as well because a lot of us fail to see it all the time and we get older and we're so angry at what happened, but forgetting that we didn't have what we needed like I have now to be able to do what I need to do to get through this. And I just like yes. I just want to like I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Joel. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And and this is just like real quick that like even with um perpetrators, we got to be mindful that these people have gone through different things as well and don't get me wrong, there's no excuse for um molesting, raping, violating, sodomizing any human being there's no right to it some people are downright just mentally ill and i know specifically for my father himself i know that he was uh um a, a, a victim of rape as well and molestation and you know that i would never molest or rape another kid or anybody that's in that's not my story i want that ain't that ain't my thing and i ain't get down I don't know, but for some people, some people who are victims, they become offenders. And that right there is a fact as well that we would just like to put out there. That was just really quickly. And Joella, I would love your feedback. Sorry. Oh no, all you guys had some great experience. I respect you ladies for sharing and being open about your experiences. Um, I wanna, uh, someone actually brought it up in the comments about it goes hand in hand with a lack of mental health support. Because again, even in some of your experiences, I think we need to talk about this blind loyalty a lot of us have toward our family. And again, it might've stemmed from when we were younger and we had a cover for them when CPS came or when you know we were faced with that and we didn't know what to do because of this blind loyalty. So when we say, oh, well, what happens if this house stays in this house? That's pretty much saying, hey, I'm gonna be loyal to whatever's going on despite the pain that's inflicted, despite the crimes that may be going on, I'm gonna be loyal to y'all. So as we get older and become more of, you know, get our own identity, we have to break the chains of that loyalty. You know, we have to be loyal to us and our experience and not to the family who may not even be, like you said, equipped to deal with any of that or even have a capacity of understanding. And as we grow, that's, we have to be loyal to ourselves and our experience. Because again, we spent most of our childhoods, especially in black families, being loyal to people who were doing wrong, but we were taught to disregard it. Then can we go to the chat on that? <laughs> can we go to the chat on that? Yeah, we have a couple uh, comments. Um, Someone said this phrase was used as a band-aid in my household to defend whatever was going on, and it was used to justify behavior, defend toxic people, and most of all was the response for that they gave for wanting family to seek help. Yes, it could be damaging to children. It prevents some from speaking up or even wanting to get help. And someone else responded, what happens in this house stays in this house also goes hand in hand with lack of mental health support. Black people and therapy are not a thing. Uh, someone is saying, thank you, Camilla, for sharing your story with us. I appreciate and see you. And some don't want to do it. They will spend their entire lives defending these people because they don't want to let go of how they see them. Some will hold on to that blind loyalty forever. And uh, we have some comments from Facebook. It says, some families are broken in a manner that it's painful to even acknowledge and as a mother, some are emotionally torn to how they could love a man that would do that. And they're saying they totally agree to let it go 
is to create multiple victims to come. A predator also breeds predators and broken women. I would like to add that uh, men can also be victims to crimes like this. Which is one of the most things that is not spoken about. Almost, now I'm gonna say 97, a great percentage of men, heterosexual and homosexual men that has been sexually molested or raped as a child and has not addressed it, has not acknowledged it, has not dealt with it. And those numbers continue to grow. So we want like, as I all see all queens that are in attendance right now, um, we have to start having those conversations with our kings too, because that's the only way that we're really gonna heal on things. A lot of men aren't loving their families right because that's really what the root of what their issue is. And they're not dealing with it. And as queens, we can. Benita, I see you with your hand. I'm gonna mute myself. I'm gonna stop talking. Come on, girl. Um, no, I just thought that, that it was really interesting that she said that only because um, a lot of times what it is is for men, where as they get like when they're in there, when they start to hit their puberty ages or whatever, oftentimes they don't see what their version of sexual assault is, is them being touched, uh, having sexual contact completely, or, you know, just um, advances, whatever, with babysitters and, you know, all types of things. And, you know, when you, when you're a guy, oh, it's all the way, honey. It's all of everything for you to be with an older woman. But as soon as, like, it's, it's, it's just really funny to me because that's seen as something that is super glorified. But with, it, it's not the same for women. You know what I mean? Like, it's definitely a huge double standard. And it's like, oh, well, yeah, well, I slept with, a baby, with my babysitter when I was, 11 or whatever the case may be and it's like and you're okay with it like somebody and and this is okay. won't even realize how that whole statement is so wrong exactly your babysitter is 17 19 20 years old you're 11 12 13 years old it's like you do understand that you were assaulted too right like you do understand that these, this, that's not okay, right? Um, and it's horrible because um, I don't remember who said it, but someone said something o along the lines of people being uh, men, men or male presenting uh, individuals being victims and survivors as well, but they don't see it that way because oftentimes they don't see it as being a problem if it's hetero if it's heterosexual contact unfortunately i agree i think it's partly maybe because a lot of men don't want to see themselves as as victims it's that it's that oh i got a that alpha male type thing oh i can't be a victim i can't that's not a thing we can't uh, no i look like a, i look like a punk like i no no that ain't happened so instead of it being that the fact that when your baby slit, sitter slept with you and she was like 18 19 20 years old and you was like 11 or 12 and you were assaulted you take it as cool points it's not cool points she need to go to jail too. And that's another double standard that is a problem as well. And that constantly, constantly, constantly keeps getting ignored. And I, I, I agree with every single one of you. And I think the other thing is too, we don't address and teach young boys what sexual assault is. We don't teach young boys and young men that they can be assaulted. This is what assault looks like so that we can prevent them from being in situations where they are assaulted. That's right, right there. So, and people don't realize that, um, Let's reverting back to going home for the holidays, right? 
And most of the time, when you go home for the holidays, all the cousins is at grandma's house. Is that all the cousins? Somebody is at somebody's house. And while we're on the topic of child molestation and rape and those things in a family, know that minors they can be offenders as well. There are all there are cousins who think that like oh. I can, I can playfully like touch your breast. Oh, we're just playing. Oh, I can like, you know, I, I've heard of plenty of situations with people and I, I don't, I can't, there are multiple ways that that comes from. That comes from either the person was either molested themselves before. It's always a fact that someone has done it to them when it's a child doing it to another child. Um, and that's just to say when we do have family over and every all the cousins and all the kids are being unattended, they don't you have to keep your eye on kids. You know, everybody is not raising their, their children the right way. What's going in the same way and what's going on in everybody's houses isn't the isn't the same thing that's going in someone else's house. And now y'all think that y'all are going to grandma's house and everyone's safe. And now you, you don't find out until New Year's or something like that. Or the next time y'all about to go back to grandma's house for Christmas, that the last time y'all was there, little Jojo or somebody done touched on one of the kids. When they was in a room playing or supposed to be playing Fortnite or supposed to be doing whatever they were doing, or they were running back and forth, catch a girl, get a girl. You know, family do that with each other. They do that with each other and it's unhealthy. And, and, and that comes from, you know, I feel, I, I'm going to say, I feel like that comes from generations of us as Black people who's been exposed to sexual activity at an early age. We see it on TV. It happens around family members. There are some family members who will probably engage in as sexual activities in front of children. Like it comes from somewhere. And those are all things that is unhealthy and can create a uh, an offender, you know? Um, go ahead, Benita. Um, so there's also, so there's a, and I wanna, there's a difference between being curious about um, the opposite sex and sexual contact, right? I mean, like sexual contact, excuse me. Um, when, when kids are like three, four, you know, three, four, five, whatever, and they're in preschool or they're in, you know, other, uh, in other areas, because they have different body parts than themselves, they're like, oh, what is that? That is totally different from, oh, well, if we do this, don't tell anybody. Or if I don't tell anybody, but look, this is da 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 da, -da. Yes, those are definitely learned definitely definitely learned behaviors um they are getting them from places it also a lot of it also comes from um places in which where you know the family's like oh well you're too young to know about that or you can't we don't you don't need to know about that because you're you're in um you're a child of god and you know like whatever like religion gets thrown into things there's like oh well you're too young to know about this so on and so forth and they don't have the conversation like the actual conversation about sexual health period or sexuality sexual health period and what the the frustrating thing um the frustrating thing for me is it's always when people hear okay I teach sexual health or I teach sex uh I have a degree in human sexuality, sexual education, and I teach kids, they think, oh, you teach kids how to have sex. And it's like, no, that is not what is happening. <laughs> it is having, like teaching them their, their anatomical parts. That is sexual education. Teaching them personal values. That is sexual education. When it, with, with regard to, you know, what it is that they um, allow to happen to their body, right? So when you say, okay, this is your, this is your arm. It is your arm. Nobody can touch your arm unless you give them permission to touch your arm. 
period. That is sexual education. You know what I mean? And because those are things that are not talked about and they're not addressed, like if you have the conversation with teenagers, first, if you had the conversation about puberty earlier, that start that changes things. One, two, you have the if you just had the conversation about sexual activity, sexual con contact, whatever the case may be, you can delay the onset of sexual activity up to two years sometimes even more, but it's always been that, oh, well, you don't need to know about that. You don't need to know about that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It completely nullifies everything that the kid is seeing. So they're like, all right, well, since I'm not supposed to get this, since I can't get this information from a trusted adult, now I have to go figure it out. And going to figure it out can ultimately put them in harm's way. That's right, right there. I saw Linda had her um, hand raised. Um, if you still wanted to give feedback. Oh, she said she was clapping. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure with everybody. So like, yeah, this is good, you know, and I'm glad that we are having these types of conversations because a lot of people are going home for the holidays and they will see these family members who have like, you know, or has been being weird and things of that sort. And it needs to be addressed and it should be addressed. Go ahead, Queen, I see you with your hand up. Greetings everyone. Um, Camilla has been helping us with a little situation. And we've been talking to people on the phone because someone just, you know, want to tell their story. And what we've been coming up against why? Why did she wait so long? Why? I'm not that we don't believe her, but why? We um so my cousin was like, Well, you definitely ain't trauma informed. No, because I just believe that why would someone wait this many years? Why? And, it, and it's like these are all women that are coming to his defense and asking, why? Why did the other person wait so long? Like, um, and like y'all was saying, I believe other people got stories and they just like they, they take it, they minimize it, and they don't want, you know, they really don't want to talk about it, because sometimes it may be their own story, too, but that's been, a, we, we've been going through last week, and we thank Camilla for helping us with this situation, and you've really been so helpful, Camilla. Um, we greatly appreciate you, and we've been constantly calling the different people out, and um, that's what they keep asking us, like, I don't know, and she's like, and I'm not going to leave him. I, he's just not, he's just this nice person. The girlfriend's saying he is really nice. He's this, he's that. And she says she's not going to wear and he has the highest clearance available. I just can't believe he did this. And they're just, you know, but she's free. She's free. You ain't got to worry about how y'all feel about it. She's free. Her story is out there. She is free. And y'all can just hold on to your little predator, son, boyfriend, whatever, who, whoever he is, but she's free. And along with that statement, I just want to say that, like, the, the longer that you make excuses for someone that you know has violated another family member, especially, or someone that you know is around children, um, I just want you to know that you are responsible as well. You're just as guilty um, when you don't um, address or call out um, the predator activity. And as long as you don't say anything, as long as you don't check it, as long as you ignore it, that person will rack up more and more victims and that person will destroy more and more lives. And as long as many lives they're destroying, you are held accountable for that as well. Never be afraid to speak up on any to anybody. Children do not have a choice. Sometimes they cannot protect themselves. I was four years old when my father started molesting me. I was eight or nine probably when he started um, succeeding at rape and everything. And it's continued until I was 14 years old. You know, and the only reason why it stopped and the only reason why I came out was because my sister went to school and told a social worker. 
You know what I'm saying? And, and, and up until that point, you know, I was just dating older men. So like, I can like keep them away from my, keep my, keep, you know, I was doing with my own things. I found, I had to find my own way to protect myself because here I am 14 years old and the other people who are in my family who's supposed to protect me are just to fly me by and in my family now I'm just this, this I'm this promiscuous rebellious this horrible per, I'm just this horrible person you know and I I'm, I was a bit horrible I ain't gonna lie I was I was horrible but that was due to what I've gone through you know and um yeah I'm just gonna end it there that like the longer that you don't address acknowledge or and it, especially if you know or have an idea. And um, the sad part and the sad fact, it will always be that where there's one, there are multiple. Um, Queen uh, Asia, I saw that you had um, unmuted your mic. Um, you still have feedback and stuff. Yeah, for sure. Well, one, first I wanna say, Camilla, you were never horrible. You were responding to your trauma. It's called a trauma response. So that's number one. We need to give you credit for where you were surviving, okay? As many of us are surviving to, to do whatever we can to cope, to make it through. And then the other thing is something called narcissistic abuse that happens to the, um, not only to the survivors of whatever assault or whatever abuse, the partners are in these narcissistic relationships and they have these cycles of abuse as well. So a lot of times they want to defend the image of this individual person because narcissists to the world look like they're like the hero, they're police officers, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're therapists, they're in all different parts of of society doing well for everyone else, but their intimate families. And so that's why sometimes it's hard for people to believe that these people are doing these things when in actuality, they are predators, they are uh, horrible, they are the horrible people, okay? They are doing horrible things. It's not the people who are surviving. That's a word right there, okay? <laughs> so in all of that, comes in the extent of what happens in this house stays in this house and it's how a lot of us have grown up um believing in that and um just growing up and just like being these people responding to our trauma so let me people responding to trauma learn something new every day okay so <laughs> So, you know, we want to encourage people as more people are getting ready to um, go home for the holidays and, um, you know, be around people who just may be invited, you know, and um, reverting back around to like triggers. If it's someone that's going to be at the dinner table when you go back home, um, let's, that, let's, let's, that's the next question, right? I guess that's my impromptu question, right? Um, so let's say we're going home for the holidays, all of us, and we all have that cousin or that auntie or that uncle who likes to nitpick at us and ladies and to the audience as well. Um, if you want to chime in, you can chime in on the chat, you can chime in in the comments. And a question is, um, if you, if you are going home for the holidays and you will see that person who reminds you of something that they've done to you in your past or anything of that sort, how will you handle it? How do you plan to handle it? Have you thought about how you're going to handle it? Yep, breathe. I, I, seriously, and like, and that's, breathe. Because at, at, at some point, I know, first of all, there's no time limit on healing, right? There, there's no time limit on healing at all. What I am going to say is though, how long, my question would be, how long do I plan on allowing this person to have that much power over me? Every, I want to come sit with Auntie, Auntie Faye and Auntie uh, and Uncle Joe and all them folk 
because I ain't seen him in forever. But I know cousin Ray gonna be there. And Ray had me on some other stuff a few years ago because Ray had touched me, did whatever he did to me. And it bothers me every time I see him, my blood pressure go up. I'm red as... As, as a damn cherry and i'm mad because i really want to i really want to knock his head off but i can't breathe because the problem is is that either you a like you don't have to go or b you walk in and you face him head on because it's going to hurt him more for him to see you and that you're unbothered and as long as i see i live to make somebody really uncomfortable like and if i walk in the room and you unbothered the moment i walked in the room that sound like something personal with you because i'm about to go sit right with auntie faye and uncle joe and eat my food and drink if that's somebody's poison or go smoke that's somebody's poison whatever you want to do that's what i'm going to do because you're going to pay the ultimate price to this because you got to answer to whoever you answer to when it's time for you to close your eyes and go on about your day so at the end of it all i'm gonna make you uncomfortable and what I'm going to do is I'm going to be so unbothered by you because I done did what I needed to do to heal myself. You will not get the opportunity to keep doing this to me. And that's one period. I will not let you do it. And if you got a problem with that, you can come see me then. But until then, bye. I'm going to enjoy my food. I just want to say yes. Okay. Because <laughs> again, okay, that's we have to be kind to ourselves and keep those, how we get through this is to keep those personal boundaries and maintain them. Because when we waver on these boundaries, people will pick up on it. And that's when we regress and get back to ground zero. So I like how you said, set the boundaries, maintain them. And if need be, have an exit strategy. If you do need to go, know where you're going, know who you're talking to about it, have a support system and a plan in place. And that's how I work through it. We got to prepare ahead, especially if we are going to these family members' house or going to not force because it's a choice. But if we happen to be around these people, we got to have a plan going into this. We got to prepare ourselves by recognizing the triggers, forming boundaries, and doing what we have to do to cope effectively. All right. I just want to add that um, we, when it comes to predators, especially people who might not have served their time in a special, you know, in, in a sense, and we're going around them when we have children, we can be vocal about, you know, how we want them to be in that family. Like, we don't have to go in there and creep around and say, oh, keep them over here. Or I'm going to walk in and I'm going to say, oh, don't let my children go around Uncle Joe. I'm going to just put it like that. Oh, y'all might want to keep y'all children from over there. Oh, oh, he's going to the bathroom. You might want to go, you know, Joe's a, he's suspect. You know, you can be vocal. Go wandering off again. <laughs> you don't have to keep quiet, so to speak. You can be vocal about how you feel about it. And you don't have to play niceties. I don't, I don't know if that's the, the right wording with it. I mean, you don't have to create a scene or you don't have to be, it's not really being negative. It's being honest about how you feel about a specific person and keeping the, the younger ones safe. You definitely do not have to flip the table, okay? I plan on getting some collard greens, some yams, a couple of pieces of some turkey, not the middle, hold the turkey. I mean, hold the middle of the turkey. Please give me the wing. I'm getting hungry. Run that tater salad. Mm -hmm. And the potato salad. Potato so. salad. I all have, I do have a tip though. If we do find ourselves going zero to one hundred, limit our alcohol intake this holiday season. Oh my Not god! Whoa! But once we start drinking, we forget everything we just learned in this session, <laughs> and, and we go zero to one hundred. Okay, we act on that hyper vigilance, that irritability, those trauma responses. So something to be careful of. <laughs> It's called envy liquid event. courage. I think that's the word you was looking for, liquid courage. <laughs> but in the event, though, that a table has to be, I wouldn't say flipped, I'd say moved, right? Make sure that the mac and cheese and the sweet potatoes is nowhere in the vicinity. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Or the potato salad. Or the potato no. salad, right. Just flip the coffee. Not Let's just 
like before you flip the table, let's just all take somebody take the end of the the tub the table cover and let's just move it on over to the counter where it's safe at. Then go ahead and flip the table. So <laughs> and light of that, like I just want to use um I just want to share my experience with that because I actually experienced that last year, um, last Christmas. Um, I ended up going home. Um, it actually, it wasn't for Christmas I was going home for. Um, a very close friend of mine, um, brother passed away around Christmas time. And I've been around her family since I was about 12 years old. So I've basically, you know, I've grown up with her family and everything. And um, one of her family members had molested me when I was 13. And um, when I went to when I went to Jersey for the funeral and everything, I knew that I was going to come in contact with him. I knew that at some point, let me just say, I had to do a lot of prep talking with myself. And long story short, um, by the end of the night, um, my close friend or the, or someone else asked me to go and pick up the baby the babies from one place to bring them back to the other place or whatever. And when I went to go pick up the babies from and the babies, I say they little teenagers or whatever. They obey my babies are babies, you know. So I my so somebody asked me to go pick them up from one place and take them to the other. So when I went to go pick them up, um, he was when I came outside, I told the girls, let's go. I'm going to the car. You know, you do them things with them kids. If you ain't in my car and whatever, whatever, boom, boom, we out, you know? And I did that with them. And I walked out and I was walking out the door. He was standing there and nobody was out there. So I took that opportunity to um, walk to him. And I was like, you remember when you um, did this to me when I was, so, no, I said, you remember when you saw me? I kind of like, you know, brought up the uh, situation in a bit because when I was younger, this close friend used to always be missing. So the fact that she was missing and he saw me, he was like, oh, well, and I was sitting on my porch. You know, I had a gate in front of my porch. He came and um, he came and sat in my porch and like he sat next to me and just started like gripping me up and like grabbing all over my body, rubbing on me and all this other stuff. And when I saw him and I was leaving out waiting for the girls, I asked him like, do you remember when you um, did this or whatever? And he's like, yeah, I remember when I saw you. He acknowledged that he remember when he saw me that day when he came onto my porch, but he would not own nor say that he violated me. And I kept my tone. I'm like, I'm like, so you remember seeing me and everything like that, but you don't remember when you do the X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. And I really didn't know where I wanted to go with the conversation, rather if he acknowledged it or not. I just felt like for me, if he at least acknowledged it, I can think that maybe he's not like that no more, maybe, or whatever. And um, basically, I didn't get an answer. Um, someone had, someone else who was also a friend of the family had walked up and was like, hey, yo, sis, he messing with you or whatever, kind of in the sense of just like, you know, I guess lightening the mood or sort of tension or whatever the case was. And I'm like, no, I'm good. And I took that as my opportunity to walk away. Saves lives. Hashtag. I took that as my opportunity to walk away. And I'm not going to lie. I went in my car and I just bore my eyes out. I cried, cried, cried. And I, I've never, I feel like I've never really dealt with that until that day. And prior to, um, probably like a few months prior to that happening, I had told um, one of the family members, one of the trusted family members who house I used to go over a lot and let her know because like this is one of their older people or whatever and when I, the babies finally got to the car and everything they saw me crying my little tears out and I told them exactly what happened to me because that that was the age that's the ages that they are I let them know exactly what happened to me I let them know um just about being around him I asked them have he ever done anything to them while they were around they said no thank god and um, I just let them know to be mindful that when they are around him or just to know that this is what he has done and this is what he can possibly do. Where there's one, there's multiple, it was only me. I don't know if he's ever done anything to anybody else, um, but my truth is my truth. So um, I feel good about that um, nowadays. So I, I, I just wanted to share that because some people may go home for the holidays and just may decide 
to confront that person. And I would just um, advise to like at least find a space where it's just, if you don't, now don't get me wrong, that's going back to triggers. If you don't feel safe nor comfortable being in a closed space with this person, at least make sure that you're in a space or you're somewhere it's just you and that person to where it's like they don't they don't have nobody to put on the front for they can either be honest or in denial and whichever their response is you take you 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 take that however you choose to take that don't choose violence just don't choose violence um choose to take your power back by not giving them any type of even if you want to, even if you want to cry, call them all types of whatever, whatever, whatever. In that moment, when you're getting what you need and you're in the family setting and it's the holidays, you want to make sure that you're protecting your mental health first. You want to make sure that when you do approach this person, and if they do, if they do not, let's just hope that they do. And I'll just say, you you already know that if they do acknowledge or whatever, it may turn into like, you know, forgiveness or I'm sorry, but whatever, you know, that goal, happiness, whatever, whatever. But other people who are like me, who can't get someone to, or because you, you can't get it, it's a choice, let's say again, you can't get someone to admit what they did. It's only up to them if they want to take accountability or not. And in the event that someone chooses to not take accountability, you take accountability of yourself and you go and gather yourself however you need to gather yourself and remove yourself from that person. Because if not, and if you stay there and if you have some liquid courage, there's a chance that it may turn into something bad, you know? And we don't want to do that. But the goal when you confront someone who has violated you, the goal is to take your power back. That's the only that's the only thing you should be focused on in the moment. Whatever their response is, you got to mentally prepare yourself that they may call you all types of names. They may accuse you. They may point the finger back at you. They may whatever, but you stay firm on your experience. You stay firm on how you feel and you stay firm in taking back your power. And I'm going to leave it at that before we go on to the next one. So anybody, if any, you want, can we do a, um, a chat check-in, Amira? We have about 20 minutes left. I want to thank everybody who joined us right now, listening, everybody on Facebook, everybody on Zoom that's used this past hour and a hour and 37 minutes with us. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, Amira, back to the chat. And then the chat says uh, they created a safe word or phrase with someone. It says, I created a safe word or phrase with someone I trust. And if I have to leave for a little while. Uh, most of the things in the chat are just responses, like to what you were saying in the moment. Um, and you got a couple of comments online. Speak, sister, speak. Yes, feeling yourself is important. And hashtag protect my truth. And I would just like to add, I'm going to um, piggyback off of what you said, Camilla. I had a situation where I something happened to me when I was younger, but I didn't know if it like I was so young that I didn't know that if it was something that really happened or if my mind was making things up, if it was a dream, you know, because memory is a fickle thing. And, you know, sometimes you're like, well, you know, I brushed it off like whatever I wasn't around this person so it didn't really matter to me at the time and when I visited um North Carolina with my mom one day this person actually you know my mom let me spend the night with this person for whatever reason maybe she had a meeting maybe she wanted to go out but anyways I had to spend a night with this person and they looked at me while my mom was sitting there and said do you remember when you spent the night with me as a child and I looked, looked them dead in his face and was like, no. And that sat with me to this day. Like, I'm still like, I should have said something. My mom was sitting there. That was the moment I had. He brought this up. Why did he bring this up? I asked myself this question over and over. Why didn't I say anything? You know, I was afraid that my mom wouldn't believe me anyway. So it was what it was. 
But I still, why did he ask me that? And why did he choose to ask me that in front of my mother? Was this a time that he was going to manipulate me or try to manipulate me? Or was it a time where he was going to apologize? So I don't know what that situation would have been like if I had stayed in my truth in that moment and just responded accordingly. But I guess I just wasn't ready to admit that it actually happened. You know what I mean? So I would like to address you, Amira. Um, in regards to that situation, I send my love to you. Um, and honestly, more than likely, he said that to trigger you, number one. And number two, to try to gaslight you and manipulate you and to make you feel inferior, to make you feel humiliated, to make you remember that moment in front of your, mama, your mother and to allow you to feel as if you're situation wasn't valid. Like what happened did not happen. You're lying to try to make you feel like you were a, a perpetrator and not a survivor. Yeah. I wanna, um, that, that I'm just like still blown on what Asia just said and the mirror just said. Um, because I just feel like, or maybe he was just trying to figure out if you still remember, because they, the thing about predators is that they believe their arrogance believes that a child won't remember what happened to them, you know? And, um, so I feel like it was a temperature check. People like the temperature check you, you know, sometimes, and, um, sometimes you gotta bring the sizzle on and uh, for anybody, and I just want to say for anybody who has experienced any type of sexual violation by the hands of anyone in your family, in your family, or a close family member, um, and that person will be in attendance when you do go home for a for the holidays. I want you to start thinking about how are you going to address that. Um, this could possibly be the day that you decide you don't you don't want to address it and that's fine too um but you can also decide that this is the day that you decide to take your power back and the day that you live in your truth um no matter what the backlash is no matter what anybody try to tell you your experience was um your experience is your experience and the day that you live in your truth, you start to become a survivor. And that person does not have any type of mental hold on you. It's only your journey. Your healing journey is your journey. And it looks different for everybody. You have to figure out what is it that you need for yourself to heal from someone violating you. And some people think just because like, oh, I don't think about it or I don't, whatever X, Y, and Z, but like your trauma, it will always show up in your relationships. It will always show up in your friendships. It will always show up on how you do business. Your trauma will always show. And as long as you're not acknowledging it, and as long as you're not dealing with it, every day that you don't acknowledge nor deal with it, you're living one more day, still a victim and still held captive of the person who took your power. The person who violated you still hold their power. And um, I just like my, my prayers are out for everyone. Um, me personally, I won't see anybody um, who probably like, you know, may trigger me for the holidays. Thank God um, I'm going to be with my cousins, the fun cousins. Um, now things may happen because of liquid courages, but it ain't going to be because of triggers. Okay. And I just hope that it stays that way. And I just hope that everybody have a great um, holiday. Um, I want to go back to the chat real quick. We have 15 minutes. Um, before we wrap up real quick and thank everybody that's watching on Facebook and everybody who is um, active in the chats and people who is um, probably healing 
as you speak, if you're driving in your car and you're listening to us, thank you. If you're sitting at your, like, whatever you're doing and you took the time or the energy to listen to us or to even get um, pointers on how to start healing with yourself, thank you for even taking that first step. Um, so I want to um, wrap up with the chat a bit, and then we're going to get into the last question that we have. Um, and kind of make it like quick so we don't go over six o'clock that quick. We don't want to take too much of people's time, but I think I'm getting hungry now. Mm -hmm. Talking about all the past, past the peas, past everything. <laughs> I'm ready to eat now. <laughs> so, uh, Amira, go ahead with the um, the chat um, here on Facebook. Uh, on Facebook, uh, someone said, hashtag use your voice. Do not suffer in silence or suffer in being ignored. You have to deal with that trauma now and not later. Someone else said, appreciate you ladies for the wisdom and knowledge. And another one is, this is the right time to go get your healing if you need now for yourself. Do not bring hurt and trauma into 2022. And in the chat on Zoom, it says, yes, this was so uplifting. Thank you. I enjoyed this space and I hope to attend more sessions like this. It is so needed. Yes. So our last one, the last thing, the last topic that we have of tonight, because um, after we talked about triggers and seeing people who are, who may trigger you and everything of that sort, um, and Speaking in your truth, you know, um, breaking the cycle of what happens in this house stays in this house. So the last um, question and um, topic of the night is how do you live in your truth authentically and be disowned by your family? Because we all, some of us live in our truth and get disowned by the home. That's supposed to be our people, you know, the, the, for living in your truth. So go be, go around the board. I'm going to mute myself because, you know, I'm getting a little parched at this point. So. <laughs> Can I go first on that one? We already did it here today, standing in your shit and owning it. And if they don't like it, then they can go. And if you don't want me here, I can leave. Like, that's really what it is. Like, authentically doing it, standing in it. There's no question. There's no other extra algebra equation, not A plus B equals C minus two, none of that. Like, it, it's exactly what it is. It's, I'm standing in it. Now, if you choose to accept what happened, it's, it's up to you because you know what happened. And if you're going to, listen, if you're with me or you're not, there is no in between. And I think that's the part people be forgetting. Like, you can't, Say, oh, I, I'm support you. I'm here for you. I want to. I'm. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm got your back. I'm not gonna let nobody do this to you. And then turn around and say, you know what? I really can't do it, but I still kind of got your back on on the low. There is no. There's no balance there. There's no in between. It's either you there or you're not. There's choices in life. You either got a good choice or a bad choice. There is no. You know what? There's a might be choice in the middle. No, it's exactly what it is. If you stand in it. And if it makes somebody else uncomfortable, that's on them. That's something with them that they got to work on. And if they do not want you there, then you got to, it ain't nothing for you to hop in your little car, your Uber, your Lyft, your taxi and whatever, and go home and celebrate your own Thanksgiving and get drunk in your own house and smoke your own weed if that's what your poisons are. And that's what you do. And this is really for real is just being you. Stop allowing every, stop worrying about what everybody else got to say, because at the end of the day, when you, you came here alone, you leave alone. That's it. That's it. That's all. And I'm done. Cause that just got on my nerve. <laughs> Triggers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so like, and, I, and I'm just going to keep my eyes quick. Like me personally, if anybody know me, they know that I stand in my truth by all means. I say what I say. I feel how I feel. If you don't like it, that's okay. Um, for some people, um, I don't care enough to figure out why. Um, and that's just in all honesty. Um, but for the betterment of other people, um, when it comes to certain things, I may care. I care. 
I'm not gonna say that. I do care. Um, but to be disowned by my family, um, let me just say real quick, when I decided that I was gonna write my book, the chatter in my family went ape crap, okay? And based and I and I feel like partially my sister, my siblings kind of disowned me in a sense for me, like you know, writing my book and speaking in my truth. So that's kind of going on with me now, but you know what? I'm okay with it. If they've disowned me, I'm okay with it. I spoke my truth. Um, my truth is helping other people. Um, it's helping other people live in their truth. And I'm okay with it. I will speak it. it. When I got to the point where I can speak my truth and not, <laughs> I was okay. <laughs> I was okay. You know, and as long as you're living in your truth and you're helping other people, you on the right side of history. And I'm going to leave it at that. What about you ladies? I definitely think it's it's a day by day daily choice we have to make. You know, do we choose to suppress what's going on? Do we choose to appeal to other people? Do we choose to minimize our own experiences? And some days it might be easy to make that choice. But then we have to counteract ourselves and be like, all right, I know I'm gonna make the choice to choose positivity, choose me. Which again may be unfamiliar for people especially people who help others because we're not used to putting ourselves first so we have to make that choice every day to put ourselves first you know and, and instead of choosing negativity and violence and all this stuff let's take you know back our control and make the choice to live in our own experience don't matter what other people say because they got to make that same choice as well I think for, for me, it's definitely something where um, I always say, like, allow yourself to feel what you feel. Because oftentimes we get wrapped up in strong, strong, strong Black woman complex syndrome, depending on who you're talking to is the verbiage, you know, it changes. But um, allow yourself to feel what it is that you need to feel, but don't stay there. Like, if you mad, you be mad. If you hurt, you be hurt. And that's okay. It's okay for you to feel those things. But get up, brush yourself off, hold your head up, and keep walking. Because ultimately, if you stop here, it stops here. Keep going. You, you got this, you got support. There are people behind you, whether you see them or you don't. Allow yourself to feel, but don't, don't, uh, don't stay there. And I just wanna say like in the midst of feeling, like know how to acknowledge your feelings. Not all feelings is just one straight thing. Not all the time you're angry. Sometimes you're disappointed. Sometimes you're hurt. Sometimes you feel betrayed. Sometimes you like, sometimes I'm not always angry, you know, and people, and I feel like people need to learn the appropriate words to align with how they feel because somebody be like, oh, well, you just mad. No, I'm very disappointed, you know? Um, and that's the only way to, and people who go, to, I'm not just going to say, people who go straight to, oh, you just mad, or why are you so angry? Those are toxic people. Those are people who expect to respond with traumatic or any type of situation where you're supposed to communicate and lack communication skills. People will take that time to like make a, a, any situation into a negative one. And you don't got to go there with them. You don't got to go there at all. Anybody else? Yes. So um, I've been disowned by my family multiple times in multiple situations. My biological family has disowned me multiple times. My foster family has disowned me multiple times. And I would constantly go back to great, uh, like I grieve their love. I, I craved their attention. I cr craved to be wanted by them, but I had to learn. I was a priority. I had to learn healthy coping mechanisms. I had to learn that I don't need to be there. I don't need to be at dinner. I have food at home. <laughs> I have friends who love me. Be around people who genuinely love you. Be around people who genuinely support you, that allow you to authentically be yourself. Because those are the spaces 
this that you should share your energy with. You should not continually put yourself in spaces where people are pulling from you and, 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 and antagonizing you and beating you up over and over and over again and making you feel less than of who you are. You don't deserve that. So I decided I don't go back home for the holidays. I don't care who you are, my mother, my father, my cousins, whoever. You can cook for everybody else, but I'm not going to allow you to cook for me because when you cook, you put your energy in that. I'm not eating that shit, okay? I'm not eating your energy that's toxic. I'm not eating your energy that wants to see me do bad. I'm not putting that in my body. I'm going to, my body is sacred. I'm not going to allow my space to absorb your negative energy. And so for healthy coping mechanisms, it's very important. I want to get to that really quickly. You have to have your own healthy coping mechanisms. You have to have your own healthy boundaries. Your boundaries are not going to look like others' boundaries. Your healthy coping mechanisms are not going to look like others'. Write down your fears, write down your anger, write down your sadness, write down your traumas, read it, absorb what you're writing down, feel it, cry, get angry. And when you do that, burn that shit, let it go into the atmosphere, let it go into the universe. So you're not allowing that space to live inside you. That's how you help yourself set free. But that's only one healthy coping mechanisms. There are so many others. There's so many YouTube videos you can look up to learn healthy coping mechanisms. There are spaces like this where you can learn healthy coping mechanisms. There are spaces where people want to see you win. That's where you put your energy. That is right. And I kind of like that. I felt you exactly on that, Asia, because that's exactly what it was for my sister, me and my sister. When I used to, when she used to be a trigger for me, and I had to learn that it was because it was the love that I was like, I really wanted and expected and would like, like, like to have from my, like, sometimes, like, when she's not in a relationship, we have a great relationship. Like, she is like, she'll call me early in the morning, she get the kids ready, all this other stuff, blow my hair off all day, we'll be fine. And then, like, at some point, I just used to get so angry because it's like, how could you let someone else who was not your blood or your family member, like, for one, treat your own little sister like that? And two, you treat me like that. Like, I could never, like, you know, but you... Three putting your, yeah, putting your energy. You have to put your energy around spaces that really look like love. Okay. Yeah. We're taught conditional love in our community. We're taught conditional love. Let that sink in. We need to be around spaces where people allow us to be authentically ourselves and they love us unconditionally. Okay. Loving us unconditionally is when they know our flaws they still love us. They know some of the things that we did wrong. They still love us. They don't throw it in our face. That's where you want to put your space and your energy. Mm -hmm. So as we come into these last three minutes, I want to take like some final thoughts and like, um, if we can give our viewers that's watching and thank you everybody who is watching on Facebook and all our participants that's on right now. Um, can we get some final thoughts of the chat? And then I would like for the ladies or anybody who is on um, who is on with us right now to just give some final um, some final takeaways, you know, some final like, you know, when you're going home for the holidays, be mindful. Let's just finish this sentence. When you're going home for the holidays, be mindful that. Let's do the chat first, Amira. Let's do the check up on the chat real quick. And then we're going to finish that sentence and close on out. Uh, someone in the chat, I think very important. It says, understanding that it's okay to be alone is usually the hardest until you learn to love yourself and be the love you always search for. That's right. Uh, let me check the other chat. Someone in the Zoom chat said, it's too much going on out here to choose violence. There are too many people getting killed over spilt milk for major things. Pick your situations and be sure that you're protecting yourself at all costs. That's right. 
there was one other one that I really wanted you guys to hear and I can't find it because someone is like commenting boo 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 <laughs> Thanksgiving is more than on this Thursday but it's very it's every single day we ought to be eager to work on yourself to become greater because someone out here needs you support is more than just saying it support is through actions and not just talking some everyone that has went through something or currently going through something you got this and you will get through it all be authentically look you love yourself enough to say that i'm going to live my life do what makes you happy and what will keep your blessings coming that was from the chat we yes, i'm surprised we on time we on time, y'all. <laughs> we on time for stuff. So, like, as we wrap it up, um, I just want to give a final, um, just wrap around and finish the sentence. Another impromptu, I guess. Um, just to finish the sentence that when I go home for the holidays, I will. What? I would say when I go home for the holidays. I will enjoy my family that's present. I will not um, defend any of my decisions on anything that I've done. If anyone wants to bring up anything from the past, I will stand in my truth. I will stand in who I am and I will enjoy, I choose positivity walking into being around people who can trigger me? Who knows? You know, liquid courage, whatever. You know, who knows? You know, I, but I will walk in with the open heart, positivity. And um, if I need to, I will walk away and save a life. When I go home for the holidays and home for me is not my biological family, home for me is not my foster family, home for me is my home where I live that I've created, home for me is my friends and my family that love me. So home does not necessarily mean where you were abused or where you were triggered or where your trauma existed. So home for me, I will be sure sure that I'm enjoying myself. I will be sure that I'm authentically loving myself first and making myself a priority and allowing my energy and my space to be pure. Home for the holidays for me means being mindful of self-care and self-boundaries, but also being accepting, and this is the serenity prayer, being accepting of the things I cannot change and being brave enough to accept the things I can change. Home for the holidays for me, if I was to go home for the holidays this, this, this time around, or especially this time around and way ahead of my healing journey is that one, always love myself. I think everybody can agree with that moment, loving myself and loving myself enough to know that if it is too much, it is okay to do what I need to do that will keep me in my safe space, keep me happy, but also keep me living authentically myself, live authentically me. And because the, the things that make me happy is seeing everybody else happy. So making sure I'm loving everyone else around me who is there that is actually supporting me and those who are actually there for me and have shown it and not just said it. So I think for me, for going home for the holidays, it's just spreading all the love that you can give around. It's free. What you doing when you go home, Amira? Oh, you go home. You home. <laughs> you home. Yeah. Right here in my house with my husband and my children this is my sanctuary home for the holidays for me is where I'm always gonna be is with my immediate family my sanctuary my place of peace and love anybody else before we end it anybody any participants you don't have to um turn your camera on you can just use the audio if you want um and choosing these positive affirmations may help someone else 
um, who is listening, um, some things to keep in mind and some things to take away when they do go home for the holidays and they, there's a possibility that they'll be faced with negativity. Um, so if anyone. Oh, what I was gonna say was when I, you know, when I go home for the holidays, uh, well, I'm here now, but <laughs> um, when I go home for the holidays and when people come to visit for the holidays, um, if it's too much, I just remove myself from the situation, like with the quick fast, and it's okay. It is okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, my friends, my family, I get I get it from my dad. <laughs> my dad disappears. Um, <laughs> and I will too. Um, but, you know, I have my friends, I have my family and, you know, we, if it becomes too much, I just take myself to a different, to a different space, a, a different physical space and, you know, continue to enjoy because ain't nobody, look, it's all this food here. Ain't no reason for anybody to be aggy. I'm just trying to be fat in my mother's business, okay? <laughs> it's like, this is, this, this is what Thanksgiving is about. <laughs> but if fat, that turkey hey. dry, we got a problem. Well, I, yeah, that's the thing. I, I can't speak on that. And, and, uh, <laughs> well, last minute and gravy is full, honey. Okay. <laughs> you better slap as much gravy on it. I mean, all of the clogged arteries, okay? Um, but no, seriously, like all jokes aside, I really just, you know, want to continue to be, you know, a, a dope support person and being someone who actually, when they say they care about somebody, actually caring, you know what I mean? Like actually showing up for that person, um, or people or, you know, whatever. Um, and just continuing to to be a, a, a adult support person um and if it becomes too much being able to take that step back like when there are other people around like being able to take that step back and say okay it's too much for me I, I I can't do this right now I need a minute go take my minute return if I need to if not I will still be in my in my room or wherever it is that that I need to be to be away from people. Tierra has seen me do it on multiple occasions. It's not a joke. <laughs> it's not a joke. But yeah. When I go home, I'm going to um, be with my immediate family. And as one of the sisters said, that really what's helped me in my life is I done burnt a lot of letters. I done took a lot of spiritual baths and I go to the woods and I rejuvenate myself. I don't care how cold it is Thanksgiving, I will be out there hiking. And when I come back, I will, I, I just feel like a cleanse takes place when I go to hit some woods. So I'll do that. I'm definitely going to be, you know, cause I'm at an age where I really don't care. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm at a place where the filter is not there. I don't want to go. I don't want to do, I don't have no justification. I'm just not going to do it. I don't want to do something. I don't do it. Cause a lot earlier in my life I had to do it took, and I'm so, I'm so proud of y'all cause y'all the younger generation. One thing about y'all, y'all speak up. That's what I love about y'all. You know, people think, oh, they tell too much of their business. They keep it real. They speak up and they tell their truth where our generation be like, you know, be ashamed, don't want to say nothing. But one thing about C Camilla, I know from her, just talking to her, she speaks her truth. She don't be like, you know, she's not trying to, you know, put on, she's her, she's always her authentic self when I see her. And that's what, you know, and that's how I got to a place where I'm in my life. I write a lot of letters. Camilla see me out back, burning them letters. That's how I be dealing with people. I ain't got to deal with them. I put, I, they, they get burnt up, burn, bye. I know that's right. Thank you for that, Queen. I really appreciate that. Um, so we're going to close out. If nobody else don't have anything, any feedback to um to give. I would like to say something. Um, <laughs> my name's Alicia Mann, and uh, Asia Carroll invited me. Uh, we have a long history without getting to. Um, that's my that's my baby. I call her my baby. However, I just want to thank you, young women, for your authenticity. 
uh, your bravery and how you're able to show unconditional love. You all have gone through some traumatic experiences in your lifetime, but you're willing to share what you've gone through in oh, hopes of helping other young people, whether they're men or women, because as we well know, men are traumatized from sexual abuse and physical abuse, as well as young women. So I'm saying kudos to all of you. Great panel discussion and enjoy your holiday, whichever way it is that you all are able to have a great holiday, do that. The takeaway will be all those suggestions that you are giving to people watching on Facebook or the young people who participate in Zoom. These are awesome, awesome techniques and things to do for your personal healing. Thank you again, young women. And as the young lady just said before me, you all know your truth. You aren't afraid to tell your truth. I'll be 72 years old next month but I'm learning from you young women. I learn every day from my baby Asia. So I love you without even knowing you and God bless you. Thank you much. I really needed to hear that today. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure all of us, this has been a heavy topic. It's been a great conversation. I just want to thank everybody else again um, for reaching, for joining us. Um, hopefully we get to plan more discussions like this. We can help more people. And um, until next time, everybody, don't eat any dry turkeys this week. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much.